our memories are closely linked to our sense of smell. The way something smells is timeless. In an instant, you can be transported to another life, another world, another you. Today, we are joined by an alchemist of memory, the founder of Cantrip Candles and the co-creator of Tales by Candlelight. I give you Christoph Fischer. I look at escapism as running away, and I look at immersing as running towards. People don't know what they want often. It always goes back to childhood, and it always goes back to nostalgia. It is a storytelling experience that is driven by scent. So there's a whimsy, there's a, you can just see something shift in it. It just kind of allows you to see imagination. All you have to do is look at something slightly different, and all of a sudden you can discover a whole new spectrum of things. Now, the, the universe goes a lot deeper than we know. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Skye, the host of the Immersion Nation podcast. Here, the masters of immersive experience create and conjure, muse, and imagine the cultural revolution that is unfolding before us. That is immersive entertainment. Welcome. All right, Christoph, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, how is your afternoon going, um, especially in the midst of uh, LA Fringe here? It's been good. Um, it's a nice, beautiful day here in LA. Um, started the day off with making some candles and actually finishing up with, I have to head to a theater soon to drop off some new scents that I did for a design thing that I just did. Oh, nice, that's awesome. Um, so this totally is not a question that I had planned to ask, but I have to I have to ask, what is the process of making candles like? Like it's something like I've the extent of my candle making experience was like, you know, dipping the string in the right, thing, but like right. insofar as the scent composition. So what you're describing with the dipping is actually a, a pillar candle or a paraffin candle, which is like the traditional kind of candle, but in more modern iterations there's soy candles there's coconut oil candles there's all those things so it's no longer just dipping it's kind of like pouring and all this other process but in terms of the scent it's it's actually quite simple um and then you kind of get formulas established and it's just rinse and repeat but essentially you're you're adding a certain percentage of fragranced oil to a wax of your choosing and blending them and, and pouring them at certain temperatures and just kind of keeping a notation of everything. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of like potions. <laughs> that's the best way I can describe it. Yes. That's amazing. I love that. Um, so the process itself is fairly straightforward, but in so far as like kind of uh, say you're hitting on the uh, thieves den scent or mm -hmm. finding scents that are particularly like emotionally resonant, right. has that been, kind of a guess and check process in a lot of ways, just figuring out what people or testing out what people respond to. Um, definitely. Everyone's nose is different. So that was something that I had to learn early on in the process because I would make sense and give them to my friends or roommates and they'd react with like, I love this. Or someone would be like, I hate this. And for some reason, the I hate this resonated far stronger with me. I think that's a commentary on how I view the world in general. But um, <laughs> Certainly, yeah. anyone who didn't like it, I was like, okay, so I've got to change something. And <clears throat> it's when I got to a bigger scope and started doing conventions and started really getting the business rolling that I realized, oh, someone might not like the scent, but they could like another scent that someone else doesn't like. So you can't base it completely on the other person's opinion. What I've learned is you just have to rely on your instincts. And if it makes a reaction to you, I mean, it's your business. So you kind of have to stand behind that. Yeah, most definitely. And I mean, I think that uh, I, I know that sorting through feedback of all varieties is a tricky thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, you want to quantify it in some way you want to have like some some system to put it into but oftentimes it really does just kind of come down to that instinct and so far as what is meaningful here how are people interacting with this totally. especially because a lot of times people don't know exactly exactly what they might be looking for or what other factors might be affecting their perception of a given thing oh but. certainly that i mean that you just hit the nail on the head with people don't know what they want often and and i don't say that in like a jaded cynical kind of view. I just think humans, we don't know what we want. And so 
often you need to kind of rely on people who know a little bit more about certain things to help guide what you want. Yeah, yeah, this is very true. Um, now, out of curiosity, have you dug into any of the research around like the links between scent and memory? It's something I'm like just familiar with the existence of, but I know it's like the sense that is most closely linked with accessing long term memory. Yeah, um, I I've dug into it not on a super scientific level or like a psychological level, but I definitely have like there's an uncanny pairing between scent and memory. We use it in one of the shows that we do in order to kind of get the guest into a certain headspace. But I mean, it's undeniable that when you smell cookies, you're immediately taken back to your grandparents' house or when your father or mother baked cookies with you as a kid. It always goes back to childhood and it always goes back to nostalgia. Even as we get older, you'd think that our memories would start to get replaced with like, and they do, like if you lived in another country and you smell orange blossoms, all of a sudden you're taken back to when you're walking down the streets of Seville. But in general, it always, there's always the sense that take us right back to childhood or right back to our first home or the smell of the carpet that we'd walk into in our dad's garage like all those scents yeah definitely um orange blossoms in seville is that a specific from experience example that is a personal one yeah i will never forget that entire city i guess i went during a good time of year i guess i was there in the spring but um the entire city smells like orange blossoms and i've heard from others that like the city can be pretty grim at other times but man that was just paradise so anytime i smell orange blossoms which is often here in la People are always like, oh, isn't that such a good L.A. smell? And I'm like, to me personally, it is more of a Spain smell. That is so cool. Um, so you said that you use scents to pull people into memories in creating your experience in mm -hmm. Tales by Candlelight. I yeah. know there's only so much that you can say insofar as that process, but right. could you kind of give a brief summary or explanation of what that looks like to the to the greatest degree that you can while sure. maintaining um, an appropriate level of discretion what have you of course of course i mean it, we want it to be surprising but in general it is a storytelling experience that is driven by scent so the people are going to come in and they're going to tell a collaborative story so their ideas my ideas and then we're going to throw scent into the mix as well and the purpose of the sense is to yes jog memory but using that part of the brain that kind of sits in that nostalgic memory memory lane kind of vibe we're going to use that to tell a story and in like a lot of depth and a lot of uh, a bit more longevity and and the sense will just kind of come in and I, I i'm fine with saying this you don't know what the scents are as you're smelling them we're not like obviously trying to give you a gag and give you something really gross but i specifically am like i'm not going to tell you what these scents are and then at the end it's always very interesting when we review them how the people are like, oh, that makes total sense that I thought it was this. Or it's crazy that I picked up rose. My mother wore rose perfume all the time. And so it's interesting how memories just, they're still, they're still moving us around like puppets. We just kind of don't realize it. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. It's, it's a staple in human existence, mm -hmm. but it's, it's tricky to stay aware of for sure. Um, so what, what's the kind of why that has pulled you into creating immersive experiences um coming out of having created like an aid to to immersive experiences of one variety like what's the why what do you want people to walk away with hmm. i think complicated question um i think i am i'm interested in the immersive field because i believe that the reality is great and I'm not trying to say that I don't enjoy reality, but I also think life is meant to be heightened and altered. Um, I, of course, that sounds like I'm like just a proponent for do as many drugs as you want and see the world through as whatever. <laughs> but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I've noticed through playing things like Dungeons and Dragons or hosting themed parties, which are things that I've always done. And I'm kind of like, well, now that I'm leaning into that kind of culture, I'm realizing that I'm very good at that. And, and I enjoy watching people come in with a certain mindset or a certain facial expression and then as soon as they kind of link in i always call it like plugging in like the matrix once they're immersed it's usually about mm -hmm. 20 minutes in you can just see something shift in them and that's a very uh it's a very nice reward for me personally and i think it's what keeps me going um just seeing people appreciate the way that they are temporarily seeing the world all of a sudden yeah yeah there's something 
really unique and incredible about the feeling of giving someone a different lens, shifting right. someone's perspective, even if just for a short amount of time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, well, as a brief note on what you said about um, heightening life and experience, um, I would argue that in many ways, human life is kind of engineered in pursuit of altered consciousness yeah. and not once again not in any necessarily chemical way but i mean if you eat your consciousness is altered if right you, yeah you know everything we do. we do that restabilizes us that drives us forward biologically mm -hmm. as humans is kind of chasing that a little bit yeah um and and it's not it's not escapism like there there's so <sighs> The the lens for this that I kind of interface with or use to interface with this concept is like escapism is oftentimes kind of looked down upon in our culture, mm -hmm. um, which in some rights, maybe it should be um, sure. for sure. But then I think that there's also the potential that we've lost something in the fact that leaning away from imaginary spaces Mm -hmm. has put a, pushed us away from playing as as adults and as a culture right um, what what do you think is the value of play i look at i look at escapism as running away and i look at immersing as running towards and and i think playing touches much more on the immersive side of things the value of playing is essentially taking a little bit of a break from the norm and still holding on to all those memories that were that are embedded into us and still holding on to our personality traits and our reactions, but being able to shift perspectives. So, for example, I'll, I'll use playing in the world of Dungeons and Dragons as an example. Um, you create a character, you're creating a, you're playing in a fantasy world, but at the at the core, you're still dealing with the same things that you'd be doing dealing with on in everyday life. So by being able to play with it in a less consequential fantasy manner you can often shine a light on what some of the deeper feelings that you're dealing with at the time are and i and i think play is a very forgiving way of doing that it's a very somewhat reversible way you it's okay to be like you know let, never mind let's let's hit the brakes on that and you can't do that in reality and so that's what the value you you need a space as a human in order to have kind of a, a training wheel or, or a training ground before you go back to real life and so i just really think playing is invaluable yeah, certainly. Um, that that distinction between escaping is running away, whereas immersion is running towards. Uh, I haven't heard that before, and I really, really like that. Well, I just um, made it up, so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> super quotable, super quotable. Super quotable. <laughs> um, so I, I realize, actually, that I lied to you before we start recording or started recording here because mm. I failed to ask the fictional world question right off the bat, which is what oh, I typically right. start with. So keeping me uh, on my toes, in, that's okay. <laughs> in order to wrap around to that, um, <laughs> what if you could live in any given fictional world um, and have, you know, kind of whatever role that you wanted in that world, what world would you choose? You know, <laughs> you did ask me this question and now I'm like, second guessing it i think currently with with harry potter doing a very good marketing job right now with a new game um i am i'm leaning towards wanting to live in a harry potter world um and that is just a world where magic exists a okay. world where there is a hierarchy that you can still kind of climb up it's not it's not medieval it's not a case chase system case system yeah yeah whatever that's called but um i do like the idea of like you'd have to work hard to become some great wizard or something of that sort um there's a whimsy there's a there's a, a they're still stuck in a time that i'm very i'm very in love with which is like the medieval era times or the victorian era times and i really like the way that everything looks the culture about that so i think i, I, I would say harry potter I love it. I love it. Um, and being stuck in those medieval era times, like, well, if you have magic, you don't need all this, all this technological exactly. shenanigans to move you mm -hmm. forward. You'll, you're just fine. <laughs> yeah. You've, you've got the stuff that at least keeps you insulated from the wild world. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I really like that. 
So springing off of that directly, um, would you be down to uh, move into the make it immersive segment? Oh yeah, let's do it. Sweet. So, um, all right, so you say Harry Potter and the very first thing that comes to mind, of course, in the context of this conversation is some of those scenes in the Great Hall that depict just this this army, this populace of yeah. floating candles yeah. um, <laughs> roaming about of their own free will. Um, what, what do you think could be the best way or how would you set up guiding someone through, say, a multi-room um, mm -hmm. immersive experience mm -hmm. with different scents, um, mm. given that you're trying to like shoot for agency or like theoretically? Right. So the idea that the 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 guests can still affect things around the room and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would start out with. Um, They'd have to smell like soil and water walking in. Yeah, I know they're already in a room, but I think that's such a welcoming scent and such a good way to make someone think an, of another time. Um, we, we've we grown to really not... L we like the smell still of soil, wet soil specifically, like the smell right before rain. Um, mm -hmm. It's technically called petrichor, but um, that scent is... It doesn't exist enough places because if your house smells like that, that's looked at as a bad thing. And it's like, well it doesn't necessarily mean your house is dirty if it has the smell of fresh soil going on. So I think that would be a really good way of like getting people into like, let's just call it what it is. This castle is very, very old. It probably would smell a little bit musty, a little bit like dirt. Um, and then as they go into the next couple of rooms, I think you, if, it, if we're still on this great hall imagery, I think the first thing you'd smell would be like food, like roasted food kind of going on, like a something very, hearty like a stew or roasted chicken or something like that just kind of filling the hall and then moving into a more studious smell like um parchment or old books that's totally yes. like a harry potter smell yeah and it finishing annoying. it off with i think something a bit more less literal it would be more of a floral note or more of a uh incense note that would kind of evoke a magical feeling depending on what the experience was but but something to leave them thinking like oh magic is a little bit real because i smelled that last thing yeah most definitely Ooh, and there's a part of me that like would want to like put like a potions class oh, almost like a little sure. scene in there for the sake i mean as you as you alluded to or earlier just be like hey so here's what you have learned now it's time to put it to the test yes <laughs> yes and and I think there could even be like a, with the food, there's got to be something there. That'd be really fun to have to like go into a great hall and like scarf down something because you have to get to class. That would be a fun little thing. Of course, there's so many food allergies these days that I don't know if it would work out well. Yeah, yeah, that would actually be tricky because it's like, of course, <laughs> the things that you like think of in that context, mm -hmm. a lot of them are very, very meat associated. And then right, which would be that like, divisive. Like, a whole chunk of population would be yeah. like, so so can we skip this room it <laughs> smells like chicken <laughs> yeah that that's that, we're gonna go right on by um so what about having people and this is completely just based off of nothing in particular but what about the idea of like having people having to like turn on certain scents or mm. use scents to um uh, not solve a puzzle. I'm not trying to go escapey on this, but like... No, but I think there's something there because what if the, there was not a right answer per se, but a adding to the agency of it, depending on the scent there. So one of my favorite scenes in all the Harry Potter movies um, is when Hermione is describing the, the good luck potion and she says that it smells like... Or maybe it's a love potion. It's a love potion. And she's saying that it smells like whatever person desires most. And for her, it smells like fresh cut grass and spearmint toothpaste and all that stuff. And I was like, well, that could be an interesting element of putting into it. It's like you can get to the next place by creating elements of what you love. And there's like a whole selection of things to choose from. And you, it would really make you think like, what are three things that I really love to smell so much so that it would make me fall in love with someone if they smelled like it. Oh my word. That Ooh, would that's be a good really, one. Really that's cool. good. Yeah. Cause then it's almost like it, it suddenly be, takes on this like 
intentional like mindfulness slash awareness component to it where you're just kind of like exploring the inside of your right. own head but through a lens that's not like it doesn't it it puts a barrier between something potentially getting super heavy which isn't necessarily right. bad but at the same time it's like it it provides this distancing barrier to some degree mm-hmm. where I don't know there's just like an anonymity because it's nobody a, else is going to know why those particular scents are keying into exactly. certain things for you. It's a perspective shift. And that goes back to what I was saying about how like you need to be able to play in order to analyze yourself. I think ultimately that's the difference between escapism and immersion. Escapism would just be like, I'm playing, I be at a video game or a board game or a tabletop role playing game, whatever you're doing, you're doing it to zone out and to, to, turn off the noise but if if immersion is built well then it should kind of coincide well with the noises in your head and it allows you to kind of quiet this part and then focus in on this part because the lens has shifted a little bit so i i always want any immersive experience that i'm doing to to um support real life not necessarily take me completely out of it yeah yeah and it's a tricky balance too because um i mean have you ever encountered heard of come across um uh playback improv as a format uh maybe is that the idea of kind of no explain it to me um it's essentially retelling of stories but through actors so you have like the stage with three improv i think it's three as the standard number i don't know um head uh improv actors on the stage and then off to the side of the stage you have the kind of the conductor um and then the teller's chair so the conductor will kind of like ease the audience in with a few different things um like smaller bites and then the conductor will bring people up to tell stories and then those are played back through the improv actors and it's really really fascinating because they'll have like the improv actors that sounds like something i would be down for super super fascinating it's like a og form of immersive theater because it's been around yeah. for quite a minute but it doesn't i haven't seen it crop up all that frequently Ooh, um, i think that would do well in la yeah yeah without a doubt um I, interestingly enough from what i understand of it as more of an international community around it hmm. um but i know there's some of it around the u.s it's but, really that's beautiful because it kind of touches on the whole like idea of the greek chorus where these actors are reacting to the story being told and i like that idea a lot yeah yeah and like so so the uh point of that was like that is a really really amazing and oftentimes just incredibly powerful experience Mm -hmm. but it does definitely run the uh i don't want to i don't want to say risk because oftentimes it is intentional but it does Mm -hmm. have the chance of becoming a very emotionally intense experience because right. oftentimes people will tap into stories and start realizing things and then it just turns into this whole delu- deluge of emotion right um and yeah that that can certainly be good in some contexts but in so far as especially like a a populace of people who are much more familiar with you know fourth wall friendly entertainment right um, right i i completely see what you're saying there jumping into something like that could be a bit jarring mm-hmm. certainly um so yeah uh all right yes i'm i'm like very intrigued to like <laughs> start playing with with scents and scent composition at some point in time um, it's 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 cool it, there's a lot i mean if anything it's just fun for you because then you can just smell some stuff yeah yeah without a doubt um so working from there uh shall we pop into a few of these uh rapid fire questions rapid ish fire questions um i i find that uh a lot of these questions uh find a way of being a lot more meaty than they seem on the surface but sure that oftentimes can be a good thing Mm -hmm. um so to start off with something probably fairly familiar um what do you tell the uninitiated um the unfamiliar about immersive experience um i tell them that i guess the first thing i would say it's just fun you should totally do it like that's kind of my my biggest sell it's fun yeah yeah um and then do you do you try and 
elaborate too much or do you kind of enjoy just letting it be a little ambiguous um is this for specifically like my setup or just in general just in general in general yeah i definitely i i'm i'm pretty ambiguous so for example i just i went to i had an immersive piece experience on tuesday night and it was great and i walked out and my friend because it was a one-on-one experience my friend was like what was in there and i was like oh it was cool but i yeah i i guess i go for very ambiguous because you don't want to cue them in too much because it would skew their interpretation of the piece yeah fair enough fair enough so yeah i I say Um, it's fun you should do it that's that's my initiation yeah yeah and i really like the idea of having some things like tales by candlelight like guest and the host um i'm trying to think of other good examples in in the la area there um just things that are less immediately demanding of someone's like super will like willingness to just like let go yeah um because like you're kind of there to help them with that i think that like one-on-ones do a really good job of that in general um yeah, but I'm like, not a big fan yeah. of the, and I, I I stay away from them. And not that not that they're not great, but productions that call for the guests to be like zero to sixty, get into it. And I'm like, look, if you bring me to Universal World Harry Potter, I'll get into it the moment I walk through that arched gateway. But I don't know about your production. I don't know the quality, so I'm I'm gonna go from zero to twenty, and then you can ramp me up to a hundred by the end of it. But you kind of have to earn that. I'm not gonna give it to you right off the bat. Yeah, most definitely. There's actually some there's there's a kind of um there's a certain texture that is kind of being a little coy in walking into experience and, and kind of like seeing how they work with that onboarding process because like instead of going into it just like ready, you get to kind of be like, okay, so show me, show me. <laughs> like mm-hmm. show me how to do this um because of that concept of pre- preconceived notions in all reality right. like that can that can very much make anything difficult and it can be a little annoying when someone's so gung ho that they're not actually they're assuming that they know what to do as opposed to actually discovering what they're supposed to do in an experience um that's that's happened on occasion even on a one-on-one thing someone comes in and they're immediately commenting on what everything looks like and like, oh and does something come out of there and it was are those the smells and it's just like well yeah but um you're still you're still going through a world that you need to be walked through you shouldn't barge into someone else's world it could be a little destructive or you can miss out on things yeah yeah without a doubt um so what's a uh, one immersive experience that you're particularly excited about the potential of coming up um, insofar as what it could mean for the evolution of immersive overall? I'm sure everyone is talking about this one, but uh, the Disney World Galaxy's Edge Star Wars experience, they're they're calling that immersive. And that is large scale in the sense that supposedly there's storylines that you can discover by like listening to some of the actors walking around the park. And I think it. I'm not even the biggest Star Wars fan. I think it's cool. But um, if they pull it off well, which I have to admit, I don't think it, they will. But if they do pull it off well, then that could really make people understand immersive on a much larger scale. I mean, if Disney can get it out to the people, then the people will definitely understand what it is. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, why do you feel like it It might not um wind up doing what they want it to do or what it is intended to do um i think that when a too many cooks are in the kitchen the ideals kind of shift and i think before a storytelling experience disneyland is a money-making experience and they still tell stories very very well but they do kind of rely on the fact that the stories have already been told outside of the park and then you come in and you get to experience a piece of it for example star wars you you've seen all the movies now come experience it in real life but they kind of I, i'm worried they're going to rest on their laurels of like you already know the story just come interact with cool buttons going on and it's like but wouldn't it be cool if there's a whole new plot point or whole new script being brought to the life but also then you can impact it i mean that's like agency i i, I think the the experience the experience will lack agency for the park goers 
Ah, yeah, yeah. I've I've definitely wondered about that myself as well because like the whole like um phone interface with like the the kind of continuously running capture the flag game yeah. that's going on. Like that was the highest agency thing that I saw in there. Yeah. And then I didn't really see anything else that right. kind of spoke to everything else was more agency, scripted and pre-rehearsed. Like, yeah, yeah, just like kind of almost more Easter eggs than actual exactly, narrative. and and that's super cool, but that's not truly immersive. So I, I question how immersive it will be. I also, oop, train of thought just left the station. It will come back, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's gone. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, so do you have a favorite candle? I do. Uh, is it wrong if it's mine? Oh, no, I was I, I should have specified. Do you have a favorite one of your candles? Sure. Um, I. My favorite one that I make is Stone Moss Chapel. It is um, soil, water and stone and moss, as the name would suggest. And <laughs> it, it it was influenced by when I lived in London for a year and the smell oh. of waking up to it being rainy and damp and there's soil and yet the city's still mixed in with there, but the old cobblestone streets in some parts. And I was like, man, I want to capture a smell that makes me think of this place. And so stone moss chapel is my favorite. Very cool. Very cool. I, uh, I can only conceptually imagine, um, imagine what these particular things are or smell like mixed together because I don't, I don't know, like usually candles are kind of just like, hey, this is one thing, right, not right. like a place. It's not the shape of a concept. Right. Um, well, I will have to send you some sky. I would be happy to do that so that you can you can agree or disagree on your own time. <laughs> hey, hey, I would I would not say no, though. I definitely have a couple in the mail already. So there's oh, that. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> oh, yes. Um dad's a big uh role player of course probably probably in many ways responsible for me ending up doing this um Great. but i like just sitting there for weeks like i have no idea what to do for father's day like what on, what on earth is this like right. supposed to look like yeah um and then i encountered kind of what you were doing i was like oh well of course perfect <laughs> yeah um so i definitely i don't i had um thrown a picture up of uh I think it might have been Briny Depths or Brian no, Water no, Tides. Was, yeah. Or Dungeon Depths. Yeah, one yeah. of those two. Um, and I was like, I want to see people taking videos of them using these. Like, Dude, I want to I see, wanna see people taking videos of them using them. Because everyone's always posting pictures and like, it's great. And I'm like, I want to see your face as you first open it and smell it. That's my favorite thing of being at conventions when I have a booth and people can come over and smell the smells. And I love it when one of them, like a father of two daughters and the, the girls are loving it because usually females like candles a little bit more than men. And so the men are very skeptical and they'll pick up a couple of them and be like, that one's gross. And they'll, they'll put the tin back on. I'll be like, it's okay, keep going. And then they'll get to like <laughs> the Black Hound Tavern, which is whiskey and firewood. And they'll be like, oh, that one's good. And I was like, well, yeah, that, that makes sense for you, sir. Um, but <laughs> certain others will like different scents. So I love seeing the reactions of people smelling them. Oh, that must be super, super fascinating. I can't even imagine just like the just the insights on on the way that people think and where I don't know where they anchor their identity just from right. the experience of standing yeah. in a booth and watching people interact with that. That sounds incredible. It's a lot of good market research. It does get a little annoying when people are like, oh, you know what you should do? And I'm like, well, I've worked on that already and we're, we might have that coming out, but but they mean it with good intention. So I shouldn't be so worked up about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I feel like pe people always have a a plethora of feedback. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes truly, truly helpful. Almost always completely well intentioned. Um, but also sometimes just like caught in the excitement of the moment. Like, exactly, and you can't fault no, them for I that. Do this, <laughs> yeah. No, by no means. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, so why? Why do you think that immersive entertainment resonates so deeply with those who participate in it? Or if you potentially want to take a more like personal um, perspective on that, why do you think that the the way that you have kind of created your immersive space mm. is so impactful? Immediately, my brain went to Rainforest Cafe 
which is tacky and probably mm-hmm. I don't even think in existence anymore, but it still to this day is one of my favorite restaurants because of how immersive the atmosphere was. And I think this is a roundabout way of answering this question, but I think it's important to me because it's, it allows you to see your imagination realized. It allows you to believe that magic is real for a little bit. It allows you to feel, I mean, if it's a horror experience, it allows you to feel what would you do in that situation? It's all just kind of opportunities to experience things that you don't, you just don't get to experience all the time. And then that's not necessarily for lack of trying, even the most explorational traveler might still walk into an immersive experience and be like, this is what I was looking for because it's that layering of, of experience of, of atmosphere, but also there's, there's thought put into it. If it's a good immersive experience, it's meant to evoke a certain reaction and that reaction could be the missing puzzle piece that that person was looking for. So I, I, that, that's probably the most (laughs) generic, bizarre answer ever, but I think it, it just kind of allows you to, to see imagination. Yeah, no, 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 that's, Certainly not bizarre. And um, I not generic because the the idea of the missing piece, I think, is something that I've not encountered Hmm. all that frequently. But uh, but I've definitely I definitely think is a common theme um, throughout the world of right. uh, Immersive appreciators, immersive, immersive aware. Well, I think that's that's what can often that's what an immersive piece will lack sometimes. And especially on, on large scales, when you have, for example, a company like a multi million or billion dollar company saying like, Ooh, let's create an immersive experience for San Diego comic-con. And their goal is to get people to watch the show or to buy the comic or to buy the product. But, and that can be a goal, but there needs to still be another goal of what do we want the people to feel? And if that is lacking, the immersive experience fails. Now, going back to Rainforest Cafe, I don't know what they wanted us to feel, but I certainly felt something there, something wonderful, something like adventurous. So, so someone, someone had a good idea when they made that store. Yeah, yeah, quite, quite literally wonderful. Just that like, yeah. I don't know, for me, it's uh, very much about the sense of discovery a lot of times, mm-hmm. too. Um, because it's like I feel like that's something that you oftentimes kind of lose as sure. as you get a little bit older. Um, and finding something that's just like genuinely surprising yeah. is oftentimes tricky without you know some degree of concerted effort. Mm-hmm. Um, especially in the tangible form. I remember about five years ago, I started thinking that nothing is left to be discovered. Like there's so many people on Earth. Sure, there's like molecules that we still have to discover, but in in the same like when you were a kid, you would you would realize like getting stung by a bee for the first time that was a discovery, and and of course this just is a remark on how cocky I was at twenty five year old, but I was like, there's nothing left. I've seen it all, and and that's just <laughs> not entirely true. And I think immersive experiences can quickly teach someone that like even it doesn't matter how old you are, it can just make you realize. All you have to do is look at something slightly different and all of a sudden you can discover a whole new spectrum of things. Yeah, yeah. Because it really is, I feel like, novelty once you once you move past that, you know, I know everything, which I do think is something that is true for many, many 25-year-olds. Oh, um, yeah. At I'm least sure it, we're like wired to think that space. way. Because <laughs> it's like you kind of have to. It's like you've just been like kind of like, trying to figure things out for mm-hmm. a minute and it's like at that point in time you're like okay just to stay sane i have to <laughs> i know it all moving on some, yeah that's <laughs> what's happening um but yeah and, then, it, and now i'm hitting 30 and i'm like man i don't know anything like it's it's great i know i know i feel like i, I typically try and orient myself to the cons of like if i think that i know or have a grasp on a given situation that i'm being confronted with that is when i am should be concerned sure. <laughs> that's what i should be concerned yeah. with. like yeah it's almost always something you're missing because it's all because it is it is it's a matter of degrees it's it's lenses and perspectives and you know it the simplest thing can be looked at through ten thousand different mm-hmm. lenses mm-hmm. and angles mm-hmm. um and it really is fascinating how quickly you do get to the edge of knowledge honestly like yeah. once you start digging in something you're like oh wow we haven't figured that out yet exactly how oh my yeah i could go on for hours on that but yes 
Um, is there anything in particular in that vein of um, in, in that vein that like particularly riles you up in some form? I think um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that we still have very limited science on why alcohol makes us drunk. And I know like we know like the chemical structure and, and the, 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 the whatnot, but I think there's still a lot of elements that's like, why do we specifically do this that science doesn't fully know? And I just think that's so interesting because people have been drinking alcohol since the beginning of time. Yeah, yeah. I, but I also could be yeah. wrong. <laughs> Maybe I just read a weird article, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of things we don't actually know. I think that's that's super accurate because I mean, you know, we've gotten somewhat granular with it and just to like throw some of some of that science at the wall. Um, right. Like you do like there's the whole like intoxication because of the way that your stress systems and your brain, your neurometabolites mm -hmm. are kind of the balance of them are shifted. But then you have this thing called vasopressin, which is why you black out. See, vasopressin, I didn't and this even know that. This, I just learned this. something. Yeah. <laughs> it's so vasopressin is it's very much attached to memory. It's how we take short term and push it into mm. long term, um, and so alcohol suppresses that. But the interesting thing about vasopressin is that it's it's very much linked to scent and smell. Ooh, and look, so I gotta look this up. That, yeah, mix it with vasopressin and oxytocin, which I feel like is a, a neurochemical that's somewhat in in vogue at the moment. Uh -huh. But the, it's like the human connection chemical, what have you. There's Ooh. an interesting relationship between them, and then it's like you the like deeper you go, the more you're just like. Okay, so there's a perfunctory level on which we like kind of got this. We know that it does these things. We know right. kind of why. Right. And but the, also no. <laughs> yeah, I love I love that though. And, and and it's kind of hopeful because it's like obviously if we got this far, we will continue to figure it out, but we're still not there yet. And think you'd think that in modern times we have that down pat. We'd be like this has been around for so long that we just fully understand it. And no, the, the universe goes a lot deeper than we know. Also, black holes. Why don't we know more about black holes? <laughs> <laughs> also, black holes. Yes, uh, that is a perpetual hanging question. Right? There. It's got to be portals. <laughs> Anyways. That's like the best way to start a conversation. Just walk up to somebody who's like, just skip the small talk. Be like, so about black holes. Look. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you think. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, all right. So... If you could have now that we've kind of dug into a little bit more of the uh, of, of the meta, the mm -hmm. um, straight away from the path in, in the exact right way. Um, I'm curious if you could have a metaphorical billboard and getting the message out to billions of people. Um, and you might be familiar with this question. <laughs> I am not. And I'm so nervous all of a sudden. What what would it say in a non in a, a non commercial billboard specifically like just oh, something I was that you just think say is... my name my headshot and my phone number but <laughs> right right and not so so kind of like if could this be rephrased of like if you could say one thing to the world what would it be yeah certainly um and it can be if helpful it can be a quote or something of that nature that you find to be particularly resonant. I wish I was more of an intellectual to be able to recall quotes like off the top of my head. I'm not that person. So I got to just go with the gut. And right now, something that's really resonating with me, especially in role playing immersion performance as an actor, as a creator, is um, it's it is a quote. I don't know who said it, though, but um, it's the idea of a price must be paid. And it's not as ominous as it sounds. It's simply the idea that if you want someone to engage with you or to appreciate something as you do, you have to be putting in equal or greater amount of energy to the situation. So in a Dungeons and Dragons context, as a dungeon master, you are creating the world, you're painting the world for your players to interact with. And it doesn't need to be so literal as to say, like, you need to describe everything so that they can see it. But the price must be paid concept comes in when you're playing a character, the party encounters this woman who's lost her child. Now you could describe it, describe how she smells, how she talks, you can use an accent, you can do all those things. But if you are willing to pay the price to experience potentially what this 
wife would feel like having just lost a child if that makes you cry, if that makes you get very cold, if that makes you shake. If you're willing to experience that and pay that price, your audience or the other players in the situation will also have that experience. They'll all of a sudden go, oh, whoa, Christoph just got real into it. He got real serious. He's acting, for lack of a better term. So that is a concept that I'm really liking and I'm trying to apply it to all elements of my life. It can be even like how you're driving down the road. You can, you can, you can really like pay attention to everything and probably have a safer drive, or you can just kind of be like, whatever, I'm just going to, I'm just going to drive. But the a price must be paid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the driving context definitely has a bit of a different hue for totally. Oh yeah. Then it's super ominous. Like I wouldn't want to be driving by and seeing that billboard. <laughs> um, but but I like that because I, I think it really is applicable to so many things. And I am incredibly intrigued by that concept as attached to immersion because I would not have thought of it through that lens. Um, but it really is that it's like, are you willing to be be vulnerable enough, be open enough, be present enough to actually engage in this in this space that's being created? Right. Um, which it is really, really tricky. To... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, that was it. Um, it was told to me in the context of an acting sense. And I was watching a show and it was and I would say it was an immersive piece, but it was it was it was magic because it was a one woman show. And she she's she, uh, telling this tale and there's dancing and there's music involved. She's telling the story about how she used to be in Israel as a party bumper up like she would she would dance at parties and encourage people to get on the dance floor during like bar mitzvahs bat mitzvahs things like that and apparently in israel there was a building that collapsed and it like killed a lot of people and a lot of people even more people were injured and she was she was there during that happening and she was describing it it's just one woman no set no stage like black box theater doing this performance and man I have never felt so transformed. Like I felt like I was in a collapsing building and there weren't sound effects. There wasn't anything. It was just her voice and her movements. So afterwards I went up to her and I said, how did you do that? Like you are the closest thing I've seen to magic in the sense that you've made you, I was picturing it so clearly. I could smell it. I could hear it. What did you do? And she said, I, I was there too. Like I got to that point. And and so if that can be applied to immersion, then you can really do some magical things with that. Hundred percent. Um, out of curiosity, is is the kind of the emotionally taxing nature of really, really getting invested in running, in coordinating, in orchestrating an immersive experience is that part of the reason why you have kind of throttled back on the bookings for tales by candlelight a little bit out of 100%. curiosity 100 percent um i don't want to i don't want it to become like a oh i'm it's just so exhausting because there are people that that work twice as hard if not more and they're doing way more shows but we were beginning to notice that if it's an hour long, 70 minute long storytelling experience, and I'm trying to give it my all, and the person coming in just maybe for various reasons, maybe they had a bad day, or maybe they have a hard time visualizing things, which I'm learning is a real thing that some people have struggled with. Um, it felt so one sided and, and, and paying the price without any sense of a reward. That's what makes it very taxing. It's not, I've had I've done three shows in a row where all the stories were out of this world and I felt rejuvenated afterwards. And I was just like, this is amazing. Like what a great experience. But, but when you start to stack up the like, Ooh, this is, this is me really having to push hard to get this person to commit to the story, not even tell a good story, but all I'm asking them to do is just go with what we've established as are the rules of this world that they're creating and like really just committing to like, what would that be like? What would that feel like? How would you react to that? And when they're just giving me nothing, it starts to really dream. Yeah. Yeah. And that definitely ties back into the, the previous question there being there, there's a price to be paid, but mm -hmm. what is flipped a kind of? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is, what is too much? <laughs> Oof, yeah. I I think you know, that's that that's answered for different people. Different people have different staminas and whatnot, but I think you know when it's too much. And it starts to it starts to appear in the way that you view the thing that you created, the thing that you love when you're like, 
wait, I don't like this right now. That's when you you got you have to scale back. Other and it happens with chefs all the time where they like create these wonderful restaurants and then all of a sudden they're like, I hate this job. And then you have to scale it back. You have to figure out a, the balance of loving it and still pushing the boundaries without burning yourself out. Yeah. I think that that is an a truly excellent note to to wrap up on there. Um because that once again is another thing that's just so applicable in so so many different areas. Hmm. Um so where can people find you in your work? Sure. Um I guess there's kind of a fork in the road. My personal stuff, you just search Christoph Fisher and it'll it'll pop up. It's a unique enough name and I'm thankful mom and dad. Um, but all of my candle things and scent designs can be found through Cantrip Candles, which at social media, it's just at Cantrip Candles. And um, on Facebook and the website, it's just cantripcandles.com. Right on. Well, wonderful. So to everybody listening, I would highly encourage you guys to go check out some of this work. It is, from to the, to the best of my knowledge, truly unique in so far as what's available, <laughs> not just on the candle market, but in the... In, in the sense that it's it's linked to something much more it's it's linked to this in this incredibly thorough and meticulous and intentional vetting process of of not just creating the things but then interacting with the things and interacting with the people who are experiencing those things so definitely definitely worth checking out well christoph Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, My I appreciate pleasure. you being on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Guy. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, and of course, to all that are listening, uh, detailed show notes and all of the good things can be found at immersionnation.com slash podcast. Until next time, thank you for listening. Calling all immersive adventurers, explorers, connoisseurs and artists. The immersive revolution is just beginning. All that is to say, we would love any feedback that you might have on the show. What do you want to hear more of, less of? Anyone in particular you'd like us to have on the show? I would love to hear your thoughts. So please rate us, review us, or just drop us a line on the website at immersionnation.com. I always love having conversations about this wide and wild world that we are both living in and creating. Once again, this is the Emergent Nation podcast. Thank you for joining us in this adventure.